Welcome to the podcast of New Story Church in downtown Los Angeles. We pray that this message inspires you to be the church wherever you are. For more information about our community of faith, check out newstorychurch.com. We hope you'll enjoy the message. Well, hello, New Story. Whether you are watching right now live or maybe you're watching at a later date, I just want to welcome you to Church Online. My name is Nathan And I get to serve as one of the pastors here at New Story. And I'm so glad that you are with us today. It's such an honor to be able to kick off this brand new series that we're calling The Father's Heart. And throughout the next few weeks, we're going to have some friends of ours. And they're just going to come and speak to us about adoption, foster care, and justice. And as we were planning this new series, James 127 just came to our minds. And it says this, it says, pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. So we're just going to take the next few weeks to unpack this, but I wanted to take us back to the beginning and remind us all of whose we are. So a few months before I got married, which wasn't very long ago, and before I came to New Story, my fiancé at the time presented me with a worksheet that her brother recommended. And this worksheet was for couples to go through that helps them define their purpose or mission in life. And so after a long time of filling it out, because sometimes I take a while to fill things out, I wrote down on paper this. This is what I came to. It was, my purpose in life is to listen, love, and empower the oppressed through serving and worship. I sat with that for a while and even asked the Holy Spirit, why the oppressed? And I was reminded that my life so far has been filled with opportunities and a passion to empower and befriend people that are different than myself, to be a bridge and to stand up for my black brothers and sisters, and as well as those that are commonly outcast or misunderstood, to be someone who could listen and love well. And over the years, I've been given the opportunity to lead worship in many diverse churches in Los Angeles and to spend some time traveling and ministering in other countries as well, and to be mentored by men and women who are very different than me, like my Kenyan dad who continues to help me grow in my faith. I realize that there's so much I have to learn from others and that my life is more complete with this rich, diverse family of God's people and also the amazing Korean food that I get fed at New Story. Definitely, it makes my life so much better. But today we're going to talk about Imago Dei, how we are created in the image of God and how has it been broken? How can it be restored? And what is the role of the church in this process? So with that said, I started planning and praying for this message, which is on how we are created in the image of God. And I couldn't help but invite my wife, Christina, to join me in this as our hearts both beat for this topic. And my hope is that it would be a visual representation of how we all are created in God's image. I've grown so much from the first time meeting her to now being married to the most compassionate and empathetic person that I've ever met. But instead of talking about her, I want to invite her to come speak for herself. So, Christina, will you come and join me? It's good to see you. (laughs) So some of you might be familiar with this concept, but for those for whom it might be a newer thought, let's talk about Imago Dei. Basically, this is a Latin phrase that means the image of God or the likeness of God. Let's take a moment to read from Genesis 1, 26 through 28, and it says this. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image, in the image of God, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. So we can see from this that there isn't more, there is more than one way to reflect the father. And it's just not one prototype or even one gender. 
Now, following this passage, we just want to highlight six truths that we can glean from Scripture about the Imago Dei. Number one, that human life belongs to God. Mark 12 says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. We bear his image so we belong to him. And number two, humanity is intrinsically valuable and the image of God is universal within the human race. So that means that the sacredness of human life is a very important principle in God's economy. He cares. Genesis 9-6 prohibits murder because man possesses God's image. So there is a dignity to being human. Yeah, number three says the image of God has not been lost as a consequence of sin or the fall. James 3 tells us, With the same lips, we bless God the Father, and we curse men who are made after the likeness of God. My brothers, these things ought not to be. This shows us that the image is present in humanity even after the fall. And number four, we we confess that there is no indication in Scripture that the image is present in one person to a greater extent than another. So scripture tells us that we are all knit together in our mother's wombs with completely unique appearances, abilities, ranges of intelligence, genetics, but none of these are evidence of any greater or lesser presence or degree of the image of God. Number five is that human life is sacred at each end of the spectrum, no matter what race color, creed, age, gender, socioeconomic status, human life is sacred and to be respected, valued, and honored. Because everyone is created in the image of God, their personhood is to be respected. Any form of denying people through freedom or value, through oppression, discrimination, manipulation, or intimidation is just simply wrong. And for this reason, the Christian church must stand against all forms of injustice and the abuse of life. And lastly, number six, human life is to bear an imprint that represents Jesus. So when we look at Jesus, we see the complete revelation of what the image of God is. Jesus is the image of God in its purest sense, the forming of this likeness of Christ in us. So when we look to Jesus, we see the outcome of the Imago Dei. So Jesus had perfect fellowship with the Father. Jesus obeyed the Father's will perfectly. And Jesus always displayed strong bonds of love. So we've learned some of the truths about Imago Dei. But to understand this a little more, Nathan, why don't you share about why it's so important that we know who is this God in whose image we are made? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's so important that we know whose image that we are made in. You know, what is this God like? And scripture tells us that God is love, and I believe that that is key because we recently got married, and I've never been a dad, but I just have to think what it might be like to be a father one day. And to even get a slightly better glimpse of the father's love, I feel like I would look at my kid and just be like, look at that kid. (laughs) They look just like me. And and I feel like I would just feel so much love and pride and, and joy that they reflect who I am and they reflect me and that I love them. I know I see this with my friends and family who've looked at their kids and said the same thing. And so I just, I just get a glimpse of that. And we reflect our Heavenly Father. You know, God says, you are mine, you are beautiful, and you are my beloved. Michael Reeves, who's a British theologian, he wrote this in a book on the Trinity that shares passionately. He says this, since God is before all all things, a father, and not primarily creator or ruler, all his ways are beautifully fatherly. He is father all the way down. Thus, all that he does, he does as a father. And that means the way that he rules over creation is most unlike the way any other god would rule over creation. We don't want to miss the nuance in this voice who said, let us make man In our image, he spoke from a place of both completeness 
and generosity, but also a humility and desire to include others, his creation in his eternal embrace of love. See, he is love, but he is also three person. He's three persons. So how can we grasp this mystery? Christina, I would just love it if you would just share a little bit more about the Trinity. Yeah, I would love to. Um, Though talking about these three persons of God can be hard to understand, and you may have heard different analogies, and, um, but I love this beautiful metaphor and concept that's used to describe the Trinity, and that is actually of a dance of love. It's a constant fluid motion and movement towards and between each person of the Godhead. So if God is love, then we could describe the Trinity like this. God is lover. God is the beloved, and God is also the spirit of love, equally loving and yielding to one another, equally glorifying each other, and not losing any value as they give away love, nor becoming more valuable as they receive it. So God's dance of love is perfect, and it's generous and giving and full and rich. It's relational and connected, faithful and consistent, and this God is the one who fashioned and created us like him and to be like him. So what if the most defining quality of being made in the Imago Dei rests upon this truth, that we have the capacity to be loved by God, to love God and others, and to live in the spirit of love? It's not about our appearance or our bank account. This is not about our physical strength or intelligence. It's not the absence or presence of an ailment or illness. You know, I think about my brothers and sisters of color who've been unjustly oppressed and grievously enslaved. I think of the prostitutes and addicts that I've worked with who lost their innocence as children. I think of my dad who was once strong and whose body is now wrought with Parkinson's and dementia I think of my dear friend's baby still in her womb, growing as fast as the tumor attached to its spine. I think of men and women facing harassment and stigma based on a mental health diagnosis. Each one of them is the beloved of God and made in his image. Yet so often the Imago Dei in humanity seems to be covered or distorted or broken. So we're going to take the rest of our time today to talk about this brokenness how the Imago Dei can be restored, and what the role of the church is in this process. Yeah, so some of you might even be asking yourself, so if humans were initially made in the image of God before Adam fell into sin, are humans still made in God's image? And I would say that would be a yes. (laughs) Yes, humans are still made in God's image, but sin has distorted this image. All we need to do is look around us or even Back on the past year and a half, how many of you can just remember hashtag 2020, and we would see that the Imago Dei is not fully realized. So let me give you some examples of when humanity has failed to align their hearts with this truth and reality. We see war, racism, sexism, murder, abuse, slavery, mass shootings, hatred, pride, abuse of power, judging others, and the list just goes on and on, but I think that we need to add idol worship to this list, like celebrities or people in power, and also self-hatred or low self-esteem. See, these issues are issues of the heart. Anytime that we exalt someone above God or tear down one of God's creations, whether that is another person or our own person, We fail to recognize the image of God that's within them and within us. And when we exalt a celebrity or even treat people as though they are greater or less than us, that that is another form of a broken image. Now, humanity rejected or failed to embrace the truth of Imago Dei, the preciousness of human life, and also the accuser seeks to kill, steal, and destroy anything and anyone who represents God's image, the person themselves and our ability to see rightly. 
Just the other day after our Easter party right here, Pastor David lost his iPhone and someone, had to ac- someone accidentally picked up a tablecloth while cleaning the tables and wrapped his phone in it with the rest of the trash on the table. And after about an hour or so of searching for it, Pastor Trent identified it at the corner of Jefferson and Broadway by using the Find My Phone app. You know, following a successful dumpster dive adventure, of course, Trent was up for that. The precious device was retrieved safe and sound. (laughs) But to someone, all they would have seen was a dumpster filled with trash. But there was something very precious, just not visible in that moment. And, you know, in the same way, mankind has been afflicted with broken eyes and broken hearts that fail to fully recognize and celebrate their own value or the value of others. And this is what we are seeking to restore. So we can't actually lose the image of God in us, in others, but it's a battle to restore this, right? And seeing and thinking and believing. And Christina, do you want to just share more about how do we restore this? Yeah, so how can this Imago Dei be restored? So we're fully aware of the ways the image of God has been distorted or broken. Um, But there is healing and restoration that is also available to us. It might take some work, but here's how. We need to see God rightly and see through his eyes. And we need to engage in the work of healing in our own hearts, as well as within our community, nation, and world. So where do we begin? Well, I believe the most fundamental quality required of us on this journey is humility. This is not humiliation or self-loathing. Actually, our God describes himself as humble. And I found that some of the most humble people I know are incredibly strong, confident, but tempered by a sincere devotion to God and with lavish love and goodwill toward others. Most simply defined, I believe humility is this. Humility is seeing God and seeing myself in the light of his truth. He is God. He is the Lord. He is exalted. I am but dust, created, sinful and fallen. Yet he chooses me and loves me, forgives me and accepts me. He calls me precious, adopted, and family forever. I accept his voice as truth above any other, even my own. So here's a question to challenge ourselves with. Have I believed I am more than or less than others? This imbalance, either valuing ourselves as more or less, could look like insecurity, self-hatred, shame, but also pride, arrogance, or holding judgment or criticism toward others. I often challenge myself to be honest with my own heart. Where do I hold judgments or comparisons towards another culture, gender, someone who's richer or poorer than me, or even my own gender, ethnicity, or people group? Might I even hold judgments against myself? We know this brokenness all too well. Racism, sexism, classism, and so on. These are attacks on our value from the outside. But there's another way our Imago Dei has been targeted and broken, and this is by internalized racism, sexism, ageism, classism, and so on. As one example, I remember a season of healing I was in where I realized I held internalized sexism toward myself. I was raised in a country and culture where the message and narrative clearly resounded, men are better, men are stronger, women are there to meet men's needs. Women can't have an equal voice to men, so women are less than in some way. In addition, I had a host of experiences and realities around me that showed me being a woman or a girl can be scary, vulnerable, or painful. And as much as I wanted to believe I had equal value, or at least some value as a woman, I had to confront this wound inside my own heart and realize that I had absorbed and internalized these messages as though I believed they were true. Other examples might include my friends of color whose children have said things like, Mommy, I don't like my skin color. Or a good friend who, facing racism for being Filipino and stigma and harassment because he was living with a diagnosis of schizophrenia, wanted to end his life. 
this just tears me up inside. The affliction can seem small too, like constant criticism of our performance or continual comparisons on social media. Is it possible to internalize these messages that then display a broken or distorted imago day within us? Yes, this is painful to admit, but God wants to hear our cries of grief and agony, and we as the church want to listen. We need to acknowledge, confront, and reject these internalized, oppressive, untrue messages so that we can be free to hear God's voice of love and truth. God is the only one who determines the value of his created beings. And lastly, if we recognize where the Imago Dei has been broken or attempted to be hidden or tarnished by these lies, what can we do? Whether we have valued any person as more than or less than or have strayed from God's heart, we can come before God and ask for forgiveness. Let him search our hearts and then let him exalt the ones who've been oppressed and let the ones who have exalted themselves above others bow their knee in humility. You see, the Imago Dei is most fully manifested in the body of Christ and in the world around us when all men women and children, all colors, all races, every tongue and tribe and nation stand shoulder to shoulder, hand in hand, no one higher and no one lower before the King of Kings as his beloved children. So let us wrap up our time together and consider a few ways that the church can be a part of this beautiful ministry of reconciliation and redemption. We want to be God's hands, feet, voice, embrace, and embodiment here on earth. Yeah, so as the church, we're called and commissioned to walk in our true identity. So in the Imago Dei, to embrace others as family and to manifest the kingdom come. The church in every heart within is called to walk in our true identity in the Imago Dei. And we need to bring our hearts in humility to be restored and aligned with God's heart. For we are his beloved. And God's word in Romans 8, 38 through 39 says that nothing can separate us from that love. We want to be like the Father and love like the Father. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. The word perfect in the Greek is referring to the prior descriptions in Matthew 5, talking about a God-like love, a fulfilling of the law, as we love God and love our neighbor as ourselves. Perfect is defined as having reached its end, finished, full-grown, complete in all its parts. This is not about performance or appearance or achievements, but It's a lack thereof. In fact, it's all about being transformed fully into the image of the one whose name is love. So also, as the church and every heart within, we are called to embrace others as family. So that means that if you are oppressed, I will speak out against the oppression. If you are kneeling, I will kneel with you until you are raised up as an equal to me. If you are in prison, whether that's figuratively or real, I will come be with you until you are set free. If you are suffering or so heartbroken that you cannot see your own value, I will be a gentle light in your darkness. So just a quick story here. Last year, I went through an incredibly difficult season, and I felt totally undone, not at all like myself, and wondered if I'd be able to even overcome this heaviness. And, and we were only dating at the time, but Nathan, um, he had no promise that we would end up together. But in my brokenness, he came, and he gave his time and his presence, and he expected nothing in return. He never shamed me, rushed me to feel better, but showed me incredible compassion with patience and with love. And this is what we're called to do, to embrace others as family with the love of Christ, affirming their value even when they are not able to see it on their own. The church in every heart within is is called to manifest the kingdom come. See, we hold on to hope that there are so many realities around us that are broken and fallen, but we remember 
that he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. And he will return to establish his kingdom because we get to be a part of that. And this world is not our home. There will be pain and injustice, but we get to continue to press towards heaven in our prayers and in our lives. So we believe that all people have a valuable and irreplaceable role to play in the kingdom. So your color and language and even your weakness or sin doesn't change how precious and beloved that you are. We celebrate how every gathering of believers can be different. We are the same body in the image of God, but we can be dressed in different clothes, which might include a unique culture, music, or even a preaching style. The heart within remains the same. We believe and know that as we read in the book of Revelation that every tribe, tongue, and nation will be represented in heaven. And we strive to live in a way that invites that picture of heaven on earth to become more and more of a reality. So as we close, I just want to remind you that we are God's workmanship. See, if you think about that, I don't know if there's anything more precious. (laughs) If God has placed his image and his imprint on his creation, then who are we to to say otherwise? It says this in Ephesians 2.10 in the Amplified Version. It says, for we are his workmanship, his own masterwork, a work of art. Created in Christ Jesus, reborn from above, spiritually transformed, renewed, ready to be used for good works, which God prepared for us beforehand, taking paths which he set so that we would walk in them, living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us. So you can see that our identity is in him. We wouldn't want to be anybody else if we have really just embraced whose we truly are. We belong to the Father, and he could have done anything with his power, but he chose to create a people that he could love and who would love him in return. Amen? Amen. Why don't we pray together right now? Lord, we just thank you so, so much for this time that we've been able to come and just pause and take a moment to reflect and remember that we are created in your image. Whether we are young or old, no matter what we look like or what our job might be, you love us the same. And we are so, so thankful that you want to partner with us, male and female. And we thank you that we get to align our hearts. We want to align our hearts with you right now. We thank you for what you're doing here at New Story, as well as all around the world. And we are just so honored to be a part of just even a little part of what you're doing, God. So we love you, we thank you, and we praise you. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you for listening. If you are inspired by this message, make sure you subscribe to our podcast, leave us a review, and share it with your friends. We hope you'll tune in again soon.